production. This is Randy Pace, grandson of Chris Meadows. Talk. <laughs> How you doing? Can you guys hear me back there? I, I hate using microphones, so is that okay? Plus it'll blast you all out. So I'll just blast you all out. Uh, I'm really happy to see everybody here today. This is great, especially with the weather and everything. And I really appreciate you all coming. So uh, just quickly about myself. I was born and raised here in Branson. Uh, some of you here know me. I've got my cousin here that I grew up with. Uh, some others. I'm a seventh generation Taney County resident. Uh, I graduated from high school here in 1977. And uh, then I did a 20 year career in the Navy. I was on submarines that whole time. So it kind of made some weird things. <laughs> uh, I'm now an environmental health and safety professional. That's what I do as a, as my, until I retire here, hopefully in a couple of years. And I currently work and reside in Liberty, Missouri. And I'm a semi-professional photographer and an amateur historical historian and genealogist. And if you've read my book already, you know that I should have paid more attention in English class. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I, I consider myself more of a researcher than a writer. So uh, I, appreciate, I, I apologize for the stuff in there that, uh, for you English people. So uh, really, before we get started though, do we have any blues in here? The blue family, anybody, are there any blues? I know there are, come on. Raise your hand, blues. No? Where's Eileen? Are there any meadows in here? Anybody related to meadows? Nobody? Wow. wow. This, yeah, Danny's kind of semi-related to meadows there, kind of on the side, but yeah, exactly. Well, we're gonna talk a little bit about the meadows blue feud. There's a lot of other families that are actually involved, and that's where uh, uh, you know a lot of people didn't understand Hey, this was over a fence. This this feud was over a fence, and uh, really was a lot bigger than that. We'll talk about that. Uh, this picture here, just really quickly, this is uh, the Ozark Square. <laughs> Looks a little different right now, right? But this was around the time, around 1898, when that uh, that was taken. That's when this uh, the shootings were going on, and the vast majority of the actual trials took place up at Ozark. Uh, one of the trials for the murder of Alexander Meadows that we'll talk about did take place over at Forsyth, but most of the murders were on the other side of the line, and so they, they were uh, done up at Cushing County. But it's certainly a lot different now, right? I don't even think Buff Lamb would remember that one. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, and it was a big deal. Uh, the actual shootings where the Meadows shot the, and killed the Blues, uh, that happened in 1898. And in November of 1898, almost exactly 124 years ago, uh, coming up on that anniversary, November 28th. Uh, and it was a big deal at the time. It was in not only the local papers, but the national papers and international papers. And the, the media was really hungry for uh, some kind of, you know, things like this, you know, so that they could make into a big deal. It, it was a big deal. But uh, they were hungry because of the Volnovers in 1885. That really was a media frenzy. It, was, it brought a lot of attention to the Ozarks. Not good, unfortunately, but it brought a lot of attention. And there was a lot of media, and a lot of people were watching what was going on down here with the Volnovers. So there was that little bit of lull in there. And then when this happened, boom, all of a sudden, here we go, another big thing out of the Ozarks, right? And so that's why uh, these are some of the newspaper articles. There's tons and tons more. So, how did this start? What happened? Well, in February of 1884, there was a guy named Adam Fleetwood, and he had just gotten out of prison uh, or jail two years for stealing a horse up in uh, Springfield, and uh, he was actually traveling back home from getting let out of prison to Texas County, and he got caught in a snowstorm. Probably a little worse than we had yesterday, but, uh, <laughs> but he got caught in a snowstorm, and he ended up at the uh, home of Alexander A. A. Payton. And, and they lived up what is now about where the northeast corner of Saddlebrook is. Y'all know where that's at? Mm -hmm. Okay, so lived over there on the west side of Bull Creek. And uh, so Payton gets, you know, he's in the storm and you know, the Ozarks friendly and uh, come on in, hospitality, and they put him up. Well, he stuck around for a while and he helps, uh, and, and this guy has a, wife back in Texas County, but yet he's sticking around here with A. Payton and he's helping him get through the winter, doing work for him, stuff like that, being a great guy. 
But then A.A. has to go off to the uh, Indian Territory on business in uh, what is now Oklahoma, right? And uh, Fleetwood says, well, I'll ride a ways with you, you know, and then uh, I'll come back take care of the family while you're gone. So uh, he does. But uh, when Fleetwood comes back, he comes back and tries to swindle the farm out of the family. And uh, he actually comes back and says, yeah. He waves a piece of paper in front of him and says, yeah, A.A. sold me the farm. You guys get out of here and tries to kick them out. Well, they wouldn't, you know, they didn't believe it, so they, they resisted. So uh, then AA decides to go around the neighbors. He tries to sell a farm to a neighbor. And uh, everybody's very suspicious of it. It's like, you know, there's no way that A. Peyton would, uh, he, there's no way he'd sell his farm there, Fleetwood. So, uh, but he finally finds somebody. And it's a neighbor who's been wanting that farm. His name is Lemuel, Lemuel Tompkin. And they call him LT or Bud. Here we go with you know uh, two people with the same name, or you know different people with the same name. Uh, you'll hear Bud a lot, mm -hmm. but uh, most people call him LT. Uh, so LT buys the farm, and uh, he he does force the uh, the Paytons out, and they go down into northern Arkansas uh, for a while. Uh, all the while, while AA is still in the Indian Territory in Oklahoma, so. Uh, Fleetwood disappears. He, he's, he's gone. He's out of here. He goes back down to Texas County. And in the meantime, AA is riding back home and he's not getting any responses. So he's starting to get a little worried about his family because nobody's responding. So he comes back and uh, he gets into a lawsuit with, with Matthews. He goes, I, I didn't sell the farm, you know. And so he gets into a lawsuit and uh, it was a big deal at that time. And Matthews loses and vows revenge. So he loses the farm that he supposedly bought and the judge rules for uh, AA and gives him all the possessions, gives him all of his farm and everything back. Here's a picture of AA. This was taken a little bit later when he was living in Springfield after he'd gotten a divorce and he was in between uh, wives. But that's a picture of AA. So then we roll forward a little bit to March 18th of 1885. And uh, the Peyton family was getting in, in bed and all nice and comfy, it's real cold. And all of a sudden, uh, oops, there we go. Oh, oops, go back there. All of a sudden their house explodes. This is an actual, no it's not actual. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, okay, we're getting tired there, right? Uh, but the house explodes. Somebody threw, some dynamite on the roof of the house, right above the bedroom of AA and his wife. It explodes. AA is permanently maimed. Uh, his wife is, is hurt pretty badly. Uh, and his kids mainly had ringing in their ears, uh, concussions, things like that. But, uh, but they were all uh, obviously hurt. Uh, it blew the cabin all to pieces. And immediately, suspicion goes toward um, Lemuel Tompkins, OLT, right? because uh, he had made these threats. So, but he wasn't arrested, okay? Uh, they couldn't find any, you know, there's no, nothing to directly link him to this bombing, so uh, he was never arrested. And because of that, uh, there's a, uh, another fellow that lived nearby named Alexander Meadows. Now we're starting to hear those names you want to hear. So Alexander Meadows was kind of a well-to-do uh, hillbilly back in those days. And he, owned, he owned a lot of land, essentially in Christian County, probably up about uh, five or six miles up into Christian County, all the way down Bull Creek, and uh, probably almost down uh, by Goodnight Hollow and, and down in that area. He owned a lot of land down there as a farmer. So he was pretty well off the hillbilly that day. Uh, and he had the money and resources to help Peyton try and find out who the killer was. Uh, this obviously made L.T. Matthews pretty mad because Alexander Meadows is helping him. So, uh, as I said, Meadows and Peyton were, had adjoining farms and they were friends. The Matthew family was getting uh, threats, okay? It never says the word ball knobbers anywhere, okay? But you have to remember, this is the year 1885, and there were night riders that were visiting the Matthews telling them they need to get out of the county and get out of the area. So. Yeah, probably a pretty good assumption who the Knight Riders were, but uh, 
there's nothing that actually directly links it to the ball hoppers. <clears throat> so LT decides it's time to move away. You know, we need to get out of here. These night riders are business, and they've seen what these other, what other people, what, what's happening to them when night riders visit them. So they decide they want to move. So temporarily, they're going to move up to Chadwick area to his father-in-law John Dye's house. That's uh, about 10 miles away from where he was at. So. On April 12, 1885, they load up a wagon. Uh, they being the, the, the Matthews family, they load up a wagon, uh, put a bunch of stuff in the back. Uh, the wagon itself has a front seat uh, and then a jumper seat. Uh, these are spring seats, you know, the wagon spring seats. Uh, the second row seat was facing backwards. I'll show it to you here in a second. And then uh, between the seats, there was actually a headboard for a bed that was that was uh, put down between the seats. So they get in the, the wagon, LT, his wife Minnie, their two-year-old son, Claudie, and Minnie's sister, Belle. So there's four of them in the wagon, and uh, they load up, head to Chadwick. So they go about a quarter mile down the road, and uh, as you can see here, kind of, uh, this is, uh, look up there, yeah. I don't know if it works on there though. But right here, this is the wagon. Uh, LT was on this side, Minnie on this side in front. Claudie, little two-year-old Claudie, was sitting next to Bell right here in the back. And at that point, two shots rang out. They slowed down a little bit around a curve, and two shots rang out. The first shot hit LT in the arm, and uh, it broke his arm, disabled his arm. The second shot went through the headboard, hit little Claudie in the head, oh, no. and uh, and uh, embedded in the uh, wagon back here. So uh, little Claudie was killed. So LT's wound, uh, Claudie's killed. LT sees two individuals back here uh, behind a log get up and run off. And he knows them. He knows them well. They're his neighbors. There are 15-year-old uh, James and 17-year-old Riley Payton, the sons of A.A. Payton. So, you know, immediately the thought is, hey, they're getting revenge for the bombing of the house and, uh, and shot them. So they were immediately arrested. James and Riley were immediately arrested. This is the inside, by the way, of the old courthouse in Christian County. Very rare photo, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, so James was tried first. They separated the, uh, the trials, and James was tried first. He was found guilty and sentenced to hang. He's 15 years old. Uh, they appealed it, and during the appeal, while it was pending appeal, Riley was tried. But Riley ended up being acquitted. And there was some discrepancy in a timeline of whether Riley could have been there or not because of some neighbors saying he was here, there, whatever. And because of that discrepancy, Riley ended up being acquitted for it. So uh, the Missouri Supreme Court Missouri Supreme Court Judge Eddie L. Sherwood, he temporarily <coughs> stayed the execution. <coughs> pardon me. He temporarily stayed the execution of, of uh, James, but uh, that was pending the Supreme Court, full Supreme Court, to review the case. Well, they reviewed the case and they upheld it. So Riley was uh, sentenced to hang. But they got a new governor, John Marmaduke. Anybody heard of him? Mm -hmm. Pretty famous governor, right? Civil War general, the Confederate Civil War general, ended up coming in, becoming a, uh, a governor for the state of Missouri. Um, he ended up coming in and going, ah, I, don't, I don't, you know, that's not cool. You know, we're going to hang a 15-year-old kid. But here's the problem: in that time frame, the, they only had the uh, the governor only had really one option, and that was to release him completely. He could not compute, commute his sentence, so he got the laws changed. He ended up going and getting the laws changed so that he could commute the sentence to life in prison and wouldn't have to release James. And he did that on March 16, 1887, just two days before James was scheduled to be hanged. He got the law changed, signed it, and commuted his sentence. And this is the actual commutation of sentence by uh, Governor Marmaduke of uh, James Payton's uh, uh, sentence to be hanged. So he, he reduced it to life in prison. 
Okay, so James is in prison. Everything looks like it's fine. But on June 4th, 1887, Alexander Meadows, remember him, provided that money, right, to uh, to A.A. Payton, helping him to investigate the uh, bombing. Well, Alexander Meadows and his wife, Allie, were walking along the road parallel to Bull Creek. Have y'all, has anybody been down to the Meadows Cemetery? You know where that's at? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Meadows Cemetery and schoolhouse down on Bull Creek, just about 100 miles, excuse me, 100 yards north of that, that's where they were walking. He lived up on the hill just a little bit east of where they, uh, uh, that schoolhouse and the cemetery is right now. Anyway, they were coming around the hill. They were going to visit uh, Alexander's uh, brother, John Hanson Meadows. And as I said, Alexander contributed considerable <laughs> money towards the Peyton Boys' defense and the investigation of the bombing. So, and L.T. Matthews had vowed revenge against Meadows because of this. So, Alexander had been indirectly threatened to leave the county too. So, it never, he, had, he had never had night riders actually come and visit him, but he had people tell him, hey, I'm being told you need to get out of the, out of the county because somebody's going to come and visit you. He didn't care. He was an old grizzly you know, Union uh, veteran, and uh, he didn't really care. But as they were walking along that day, him and he and Allie, uh, Alexander was shot in the back. Okay? And Allie recognized the shooter, L.T. Matthews. Okay? She even said, L.T., don't shoot me. And the guy looked, walked, looked at him, looked at her, and turned around and ran off. And this is a picture of Allie Meadows. This is my great-great-great-grandmother, yeah. Allie. This is the area, kind of a bad photo, but this is the area down there. Bull Creek would be down here, just below that, and that's the area where he was killed. So, L.T. Matthews goes on trial. Uh, he was quickly arrested because of the threats he had made, and because of, obviously, Allie's uh, direct testimony, eyewitness testimony of it. But an inquest was held. Uh, and see if you recognize some of these, uh, those of you who know your ball number history, Madison Day, he was mm -hmm. the coroner, and James K. Pope McAfee was the sheriff. Two of the original ball numbers, right? 13 Taney County ball numbers. And then the, uh, the recorder was Stephen Blue. We're going to talk about him a lot here in a little bit. But it's Stephen Blue was a recorder at the inquest. So uh, Alexander's buried, if you go down to the Meadows Cemetery, uh, the Meadows Schoolhouse in the Meadows Cemetery, and that's where Alexander's, Alexander's buried, and that's his headstone. And, and Allen. Uh, but anyway, L.T. Uh, Matthews' trial was held on October four, uh, between October 14th and 17th of 1887 before Judge W.D. Hubbard. And uh, he was, uh, he was, and then uh, also, again, remembering your ball over history, James DeLong was the prosecutor, and Reuben Branson was the uh, County clerk. So, got some other guys in here. The trial was actually held at the uh, Forsyth School because the county courthouse had burned and the new courthouse wasn't ready. So, they held it at the, uh, the school. And, but Matthews was, ended up being acquitted. Um, even though Allie had the direct testimony, eyewitness testimony, there was uh, some other people that said that he was in another place at another time. And for whatever reason, they believed him, or believed them, and uh, he was acquitted of the crime. So, pretty fun so far, right? So we go back to James Payton. He's up uh, in the Missouri State uh, Penitentiary at the time, and he's been there for 10 years now, and this uh, life sentence. Um, and uh, in 1894, the Payton family had tried repeatedly they were writing the governors, trying to get him a pardon, no go. And uh, finally, uh, we have Governor William Stone comes in, and James Payton writes to Governor Stone himself and says, hey, I will tell you who the second shooter was if you will give me a pardon. Governor Stone bought it, and he said, uh, okay. And uh, James named John Sanford Bud Meadows. Here we go, another Bud. But this is Bud Meadows. This is going to be important because this is the Bud Meadows who's going to be involved in the shooting later. But 
he names Bud Meadows as a second shooter. Well, why? Because the night before the shooting of Claudie Meth the, the, uh, uh, Claudi Matthews, uh, he had stayed at the Meadows house. And he claims that this, now he claims that he and Bud Meadows had come up with this plan to kill LT Matthews. But why would he wait 10 years to point out Bud as the shooter? Why didn't he do that when his own brother was on trial for his life? You know, so it kind of sounds a little suspicious, right? And that's exactly what the uh, court thought as well, because, uh, uh, well, Governor, Governor uh, Stone did pardon James. He was good to his word. But then, due to lack of evidence, the grand jury refused to indict Bud Meadows. Essentially, they thought the same thing, that, hey, he just used it as a reason to get a pardon. And so uh, Bud Meadows was never, never prosecuted for it. Okay. And James moved to St. Louis and, and ended up working in a leather company for many years. Uh, he had kind of a tragic um, uh, time over the years. You know, he came back home, uh, got married, wife died young, kid died young. It was, he's had a pretty tragic life. This is uh, Governor Stone, and this is the actual pardon that he gave James Payton. So, now we come to when Bill Creek ran red. I call it that because that's what my grandfather called it in his, when he wrote the book the first time. Uh, this is the actual uh, battle between the Meadows and the Blues that became so famous. So Steve Blue, remember Steve Blue? He was the inquest, uh, he was the recorder for the inquest for Alexander Meadows. Well, they were all good friends. They were all neighbors, good friends. So he and John Sandberg, I'll just call him Bud Sandberg. Uh, Meadows had adjoining farms at the mouth of Dry Hollow. Later on, I'll show you a map and I'll show you exactly where that's at. Uh, about a month ago, I went down there and, and uh, finally got, I got permission from the home, homeowner to go on the land and looked at Bud's. The, uh, there's still, the, uh, you can see where the foundation of the house was and you know, looked over the battlefield and the land there and all that, it's still, it's still there. It's all kind of cut up because of uh, Saddlebrook, but I'll show you where that's at here in a little bit. Mm, come on. <laughs> okay. There we go. So that's Bud Meadows, about the time that this happened. That's a picture of him. They had a common fence, and everybody talks about that. Uh, research this before has always heard that this was over a fence. Uh, somewhat true, <clears throat> but Bud didn't feel like uh, that uh, Steve was keeping up his part of the bargain, right? <coughs> Bud was supposed to provide the, uh, the 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 long poles part of the fence, while Steve did what they call the uprights, which is the Y part. In fact, there's kind of a picture here. The fence like this, split rail fence. Most people call it split rail fence back then. They also called it a worm fence because it went like that, right? Split rail or worm fence. So Steve was keeping, Steve uh, Blue was doing the uprights and Bud was providing the split rails. And they were supposed to keep up the fence, keep it in good shape, but he didn't feel like Steve, Bud did not feel like Steve was doing that. So. Uh, Bud goes to an attorney, uh, Lum West, in Ozark, and he gets uh, the paperwork to dissolve their partnership. But there was a six-month uh, waiting period. He had to wait six months. So at the end of that six months, in mid-November, there was the first encounter. And what happened was that uh, uh, Bud waited the six months. He decided he's going to work on the fence and start tearing it apart. Uh, he goes down to the fence, and there was a group of blues there at that time, a pretty good sized group of about six of them, and they kind of uh, made fun of him, uh, patronized him a little bit, uh, and ran him off. At one point, they made him look down the barrel of a shotgun, uh, and uh, some, kind of, some of the evidence shows that, that Pete, uh, Pete Blue asked him if he could see the loads of the shotgun down the barrel. So, and just... Uh, Kind of just basically harassing. 
so that was the first encounter. But on November 30th, 1898, this is when it all culminated. <coughs> so Bud Meadows assembles a work party, and he gets together to uh, these, this group of folks and uh, family to help him tear down the old border fence and build a new one in what's, and produce what's called a devil's lane. So when you made two fences between them, there would be that little gap between them. And back then, that was called a devil's lane, where they could run up and down it, and they could work on it and uh, move their their uh, wagons, whatever might need. So part of, uh, I'm going to give you who all was part of the Meadows group right now. And the first one was Jake Squire Blue. So Meadows has got a blue on his side. But, but Jake was not really very willing. Jake was the brother to Steve Blue. And the only reason that uh, he agreed to help Bud Meadows is because he owed him money. So he figured this was a way to pay it off. And so he agreed to be there that day to help pay off his debt. Next one he got was a guy named Frank Tabor. I call him the weasel. Uh, Frank Tabor was kind of an instigator and kind of a little bit of a coward and a weasel. And uh, anyway, this is a picture of Frank. And he was a real good friend of Bud Meadows, though. So. Then you got Posey Blue. Uh, Posey Blue was Bud Meadows' father-in-law. Now we're talking about all this intermarrying between the Blues and Meadows, right? So uh, Bud Meadows had married uh, Salina, his uh, O.C.'s uh, daughter. By the way, the family tree is kind of a wreath. It just, <laughs> it just, it just keeps going around, okay? No roots, no nothing, just down. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then he got Will Blue, that was one of Hosey Blue's uh, sons, and so a brother-in-law to, to Bud. You got Jimmy Blue, who was also one of uh, Hosey's sons. You got Martin Blue, I don't have a picture of him, but Martin Blue, another one of Hosey's sons. And then you got Jimmy Llewellyn. Uh, Jimmy Llewellyn was a uh, nephew to Steve Blue's wife, Elizabeth. So again, <laughs> it's hard to keep up. All the Jimmys and Jameses, all that, yeah. And then uh, he got his younger brother, Bob Meadows. And then finally, he got Austin McKinney. He was called a stranger for the longest time because nobody knew who his name was. Uh, everybody just called him the, the stranger, the stranger. They finally found out who he was. Uh, he was this, this poor guy got roped into <laughs> this situation by uh, he just happened to be passing through the area. And uh, it was nighttime, and he asked Bud Meadows if he could camp on his, uh, on his land for the night. And he said, yeah, no problem. And uh, he goes, hey, you want to make some money? Tomorrow we're going to work on this fence. And he said, sure. So that's how he got roped into this. So on the blue side, you have Steve and his sons, Pete and Jimmy. Those were the three people on the, on the blue side. So that morning, on the morning of the 28th, they were taking a wagon over to his brother, Jake Ballou's house, and, uh, and he was going to drop it off. Both Steve and Pete were armed, for whatever reason. And uh, when they got to Jake's house, they found out that, uh, that he, was, he wasn't there. He had gone to work on, uh, on <coughs> Bud Meadows' fence. Okay? Uh, so they rushed back, they drove the uh, wagon in on the south side of the fence, which was the blue side of the fence, and they got out and they started addressing and arguing the group of men that were there. Now the group, the Meadows group had broke into two groups. There was uh, essentially uh, Bud, Bob, and Frank Tabor were up at the north end of the fence, and the group down at the south end by the blue fence was all the rest of them. It was McKinney. And, and all the, all the rest of that group. So the Blue started arguing with that, that group of McKinney and uh, Jake Blue and, and all them, started our, and the, the Martin Blue and all, all those guys started arguing with them down there. It became very heated. Uh, at this time, Austin McKinney was a smart one, and he said, hey, I'm just, uh, I'm just a stranger here. So uh, he walked away. He goes back up to the Meadows house to his family, and he watched this whole thing from the 
uh, the porch of the Meadows house when it went down. Jake Ballou, Squire Ballou, uh, he tried his best to calm the day down. He said, hey, let's make peace here. You know, let's, let's not get into, you know, let's not be uh, getting into a fight here and tried to calm everybody down. And it worked for a little bit. They actually did calm down. But uh, Jimmy, little Jimmy Blue, ran back to the house and he grabbed uh, some more weapons and he came back with his, his mother Elizabeth Blue, Steve's, uh, Steve's wife, and John Whitten Blue, who is the patriarch of all the blues, right? That was Steve's father. Came back with John Whitten Blue and uh, back to, and Jimmy <coughs> with uh, guns and came to the fence. And Salina Meadows, <coughs> Bud's wife, Charlotte Meadows, Bob's wife, and Francis Tabor, who was Frank Tabor's wife, they all came down there. So now we got a whole big old group of people <coughs> off the fence, right? So things calmed down for a little bit, and Salina and Charlotte and Francis, they started backing off a little bit. They started going back toward the Bud's house. Um, but Bud, he was up to the north end. He saw the argument was going on. So he went to the house, grabbed his Winchester, and grabbed Bob's shotgun, and ended up going down that uh, group. So now we got everybody together. We got all the Meadows Blues, the Blues on the Meadow side, the Blues on the Blue side. Yeah, it's, it's one bit. Yeah. But one of the hardest parts of writing the book was keeping everybody straight. So it's very, very difficult. So Bud goes down to the fence. They argue for a little bit, and they start walking away. Uh, he argued a little bit with Steve, went back and forth. The language was pretty salty, but uh, yeah, and uh, he starts to walk away. But the interesting thing about this is that there were about 20 people down at the fence or around the fence, including um, Blue's youngest son. He ended up coming down to the fence named Joe, uh, this preacher named Clinkenbeard who had come to visit the meadows. And also, this passerby that was on the Old Bluff Road that was right adjacent to the property. So we've got 20 people in that area, but yet none of their stories matched. So, now, I've got some law enforcement in here. That just, uh, it just goes to show how much credit, or how much you got to give eyewitness testimony, because you got 20 people that none of them can get their story straight. They, none of them completely match, and which just baffles me. I would have thought at least two out of them would have, you know, but, but no. So from here on, I will tell you that most of this is my opinion on what happened. And uh, I think it's pretty factual based, and here's why. One of the biggest reasons that I did the book was because I always felt like that my grandfather, and there was a couple other people that wrote some things on it, um, that they didn't go far enough into it, it wasn't deep enough, it just seemed kind of weird that it was just over a fence. And so I started digging deeper into it. And where I really hit the gold mine was uh, I had sent off to ask for, uh, through the Missouri, uh, the State Historical <coughs> Society, I would asked for the disposition of Bud Meadows' case with the Supreme Court. As you see later, it, it will go to the Supreme Court. And when they came back, they said, okay, do you want all 547 pages? And I was like, what? 547 pages. I thought it'd just be a, you know, basically a thing that said, yeah, this is a disposition. And they said, no, this is the entire transcripts of the of the uh, trials. I'm like, yes, I do want that. The thing that my grandfather and everybody else had uh, seen before, when uh, and they, they, you've seen probably some of you who have looked at this before, is some of the testimony. Well, that was only the testimony that was done during the preliminary trial and the grand jury <coughs> trial, which was only the uh, prosecution side of things. There was no uh, no defense witnesses called at the preliminary trial or at the uh, grand jury trial. So when I got this full transcript of the entire trial, the actual criminal trial, that told the whole story. Now I had everybody and what their testimonies were. And so that was really, and this had never been seen before. When I got to see it, it was still tied up. They, they actually tie, tie these up with a red ribbon, and it was still tied up and never been looked at before since 
that since the Supreme Court had looked at it. So yeah, that was a real that was a real gold mine for me, and it broke this thing kind of open for me. But anyway, so that's what I base my opinion on is when is me going back and me thinking like a juror, I guess, and reading this. So uh, so what I think happens next is that uh, Pete definitely gave little Jimmy a revolver and said, hey, use this if you need to. You know, kill, kill you some meadows if you have to. Um, but Bud and, Bud and Bob, they start walking away, uh, and they start talking to Will Blue. And for whatever reason, uh, Will Blue was pretty animated. About that time, Bud turns around, and Steve fires his shotgun towards Bud, toward Bud Meadows. Uh, whether it was an accident or whether it was on purpose, we don't know. But it's pretty obvious that he, he shot first. Um, so Bud takes his Winchester. He returns fire, but he misses. Uh, Steve fires again, but he hits Frank Tabor. He didn't like Frank Tabor. He, he's a little weasel. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and by the way, Frank Tabor was married to Steve's daughter. That's it. I forgot that part, right? Yeah. So he didn't like his son-in-law at all. Yeah. So he tries to shoot his son-in-law. And he hits him in the leg. And uh, Tabor, he just crawls off and gets behind a stalk of corn. Uh, so he hides the rest of the time. Uh, so Bud shoots again. This time, he hits Steve in the right side, goes to his right side, comes out the left side, and Steve drops, and he's dead. Um, is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Blue, seeing Steve getting shot, she jumps over the fence. She has a knife that she used to uh, cut uh, stems for her, uh, her pipe, her corn cob pipe. And she takes this knife, and she starts hacking away at Bud Meadows at his shoulders and neck and head area. Pete jumps the fence, and he starts attacking the Meadows by shooting his shotgun, empties it, pulls out his Winchester, and starts shooting his Winchester. Bud, uh, yeah. uh, then Bud throws off uh, Elizabeth Blue and takes aim and shoots Pete in the head. Now this will become a big issue uh, later on. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed one. Bud Meadows, excuse me, Bob Meadows actually shoots Pete first, kind of hits him in the hand and thigh with, with shotgun pellets, so it, wasn't, it didn't uh, disable him. But then, then Bud goes ahead and shoots Pete, shoots him in the head. So this becomes a big issue because in later testimony, Elizabeth Blue and the Blues will say that Bud actually came around while Pete was on the ground and shot Pete in the back of the head, execution style. All the Meadows will swear that he was shot from the front. And this makes a big difference as to whether it was an ex like an execution, they were out to kill him, or whether it was uh, basically self-defense, right? But uh, Bud shoots uh, Pete in the head, killing him. Uh, Jimmy starts firing wildly, and Bud, unfortunately, Bud shoots Jimmy and sh uh, shoots him uh, right in the navel, coming out his back. Jimmy did not die instantly. Um, uh, he lived long enough for, <coughs> they ran down to the creek, down to Bull Creek, and grabbed a hat full of water, tried to bring it back, and at least console him with some water, but then he died in his uh, grandfather's arms. This is kind of a diagram of the, uh, the, the battlefield itself. Probably a little bit should be skewed a little bit. The north is like up here, south over here. As you can see, all the meadows with their the blues that were on their side are over here. They had the fence, and then you've got the uh, three blues on the other side that were shot. And this is the infamous photo that some of you have probably seen of the blues after they were shot and they laid them out in bed. Uh, you've got little Jimmy there on the left. You've got Pete in the middle, and there's even you can see the speck where the where you shot in the face right there, and then that's Steve on the right. There's an interesting story where they talked about uh, uh, the, the, they didn't want to undress them on the front porch of the of the blue home before they took them in because there was women present. Yeah. So they made sure they took them inside and undressed them later on inside the house and uh, dressed them up in these night shirts and that's when that photo was taken. 
So arrest, that's uh, the actual warrant. Uh, that was the warrant for the arrest of the uh, of Bud Meadows, Bob Meadows, Hosea Blue, Mark Blue, and Frank Taver. <coughs> but after the preliminary hearings, uh, Frank Taver was actually released, and they went, but they went ahead and in his place, uh, Will Blue was indicted. They, they decided that he was an antagonizer. He had kind of caused all this, and so he was actually arrested and they were sent to the, uh, the Christian County Jail. This is a picture of uh, here on the left, that's Chris Meadows, that would be my great great grandfather. <coughs> that's Bob Meadows, excuse me, uh, Bud Meadows in the middle and Bob Meadows on the right. This was taken about the time of the shooting. Uh, Chris Meadows was the older brother, the oldest brother of all the, of the Meadows there, and that's where, uh, uh, in interesting story when you read the book about how they were arrested uh, because Bud Meadows was on his way to turn himself in in Christian County, but it was getting late, so he stopped at his brother Chris's house and spent the night. Well, the sheriff caught up with him, and uh, they came in the house, and instead of taking him into custody and shackles and all that, he just uh, said, okay, I'll, uh, we'll sleep here tonight. You can see, you know, they just all slept there in the same cabin together, and uh, the sheriff put his gun up on the so I guess they weren't worried about <laughs> breaking out or anything because it was kind of unusual. But, uh, yeah. All right, so the trials. On uh, April 14th of uh, 1899, Bud Meadows goes on trial. They separated all the trials. Bud Meadows goes on trial uh, in front of James T. Neville. He was a pretty famous judge back in the day. For those of you that might be in the legal industry, uh, judge Neville was a legend in, the, in Christian County, or well, around the whole area, Springfield. Uh, you know, he had a pretty big area that he went around his circuit. Uh, eventually, Bud was convicted of second-degree murder and sent to 10 years in prison. And he probably would have been acquitted except for the controversy over the head, the headshot. You have the conflicting testimony with the blues. You got the grieving wife saying that he was shot uh, execution style in the back of the head, and then you got the Meadows and, and their compadres saying that you know, he was shot from the front. So instead of getting life, which the Blues wanted, or getting acquitted, which the Meadows wanted, he was given a t kind of split the difference. They gave him a 10-year sentence. Uh, obviously, they uh, uh, appealed it, but during the appeal, uh, the prosecution had more trials coming. They, they had Hosey, they had Will, they had all these, Bob, they had other trials coming up. So they decided they wanted, they wanted to make their case more solid. So they decided to exhume Pete and have his head examined, uh, much like I should have right now. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, they, got his, they did exhume him, and they sent his uh, head to St. Louis to be, uh, to be looked at. Uh, interesting enough, uh, Hosey goes on trial in, in uh, August, and during that trial, the, uh, they brought in the head of Pete into the courtroom. Yeah. Now you think, yeah. So things are a little bit different back then. Uh, if, you read, if you read my book, you'll see some of the, the strange things that happened back then with regards to court cases. Uh, there was some, uh, for example, the, the crude ballistics testing they did on a dog. And uh, I hate to offend anybody here. I know I'm an animal lover too. I'm a dog lover. But, uh, you know, they justified it by talking about that it was a yellow dog. And yellow dogs just weren't, you know, I guess they weren't liked very well back then. And he was a mangy yellow dog that was just uh, hanging around the square in Ozark. So they, they, they took the dog, they dressed up the dog in human clothes, and they hung it from a tree and they shot bullets into it. Yeah. To compare for ballistics testing. So there was some. There was another part where one of the uh, lawyers dressed up in one of the dead man's clothes with the bullet holes and the blood still on it, and the lawyer dressed up in those clothes and was, yeah. They did some strange things back then. So, but anyway, uh, it conclusively showed uh, that he was definitely shot from the front. Uh, so. There was, uh, he had a, a group of uh, doctors look at it besides himself, this doctor up in St. Louis, and they all agreed that he was shot from the front. 
So the prosecution, it kind of worked against them. Uh, they, they made a big mistake in, in exhuming Pete's head, or maybe it was the right thing to do because justice was well served. Then. But uh, anyway, because of that, Hosey was acquitted, and, uh, and he said he would never go back to his home, which he didn't, and he traded his farm for a guy named Bone, with a guy named Bone Terry, uh, the Terrys. <clears throat> That's a whole nother book in itself. Uh, has anybody ever heard of Bone Terry and the mm -hmm. thing? Yeah. So Bone Terry uh, had his own little feud going on, and I, I say little, they basically had little armies that were happening, uh, shootings are going on <coughs> in southern, southern Missouri, northern Arkansas. They were crossing the border and raiding on each other. Well, old Bone uh, got raided one night, and they hung him up in a, up in a tree, uh, and then they rode off, and his wife came, or excuse me, his uh, mother came out and cut him down, and he survived. But he decided it's probably time to get out of Stone County. Uh, yeah. So uh, because of that, he traded farms with uh, eventually with Bud Meadows as well. Uh, the Terry's the, uh, traded with Bud and Hosey, and so Bud and Hosey we still got to finish up with Bud's trial. But they moved to Stone County, and uh, Bone Terry lived up there, and the other Terry's lived up there in where Bud lived. And interesting. When I went up the other day to see the uh, land, and I saw the foundation where Bud's house was, there's a well there, and uh, the well's got a concrete cover over it, and in the tub, in the cover, it's got the name Terry, that somebody had, in the concrete, where they had written it with, written it with their finger in the concrete. Cool. So, yeah, it's kind of neat to see. So, uh, by the way, this is the original uh, jury verdict that, uh, uh, sent, that sentenced uh, Bud, he was guilty, into 10 years. All kinds of information when you look for it. I, I really, the State Historical Society and the State, uh, you know, the uh, Secretary of State's office, they've got so much information, and if you've never looked into those, those resources, it's incredible what you can get there if you're doing genealogy and stuff. <coughs> so the post trials, uh, on December 4th, 1899, the trial of Bob Meadows was supposed to begin, but he was still sick. He'd been sick with typhoid fever, and that was one of the biggest reasons that they separated the trials because he was sick. He couldn't, uh, he couldn't even, he was uh, uh, on a cot in the jail. He couldn't even come into the courtroom. He was so bad. But on uh, May 15th of 1900, the Missouri Supreme Court reverses and remands the case of Bud Meadows back to the circuit court for a new trial. I didn't know that at the time. I just I, there was, it got kind of uh, gray, you know, from what my grandfather and others had written, and that's the point there where I decided I wanted to go find out what the Supreme Court had done with Bud, Bud Meadows' trial, and that's where I found the trial transcripts. Uh, on December fifth, Bud was supposed to go on trial, but uh, his lawyer made a motion to quash or to dismiss the case. Uh, and Judge, but Judge Neville said no, and he overruled it. Unfortunately, the next day when the trial was going to start, Elizabeth Blue died, and she was the prosecution's key witness. So at that point, Judge Neville said, had enough, and he uh, dismissed the case. So you would think it would be over, but no, there's more. <laughs> uh, there was a change in politics. Uh, people who were elected up in Christian County uh, at that time, Jake Blue, uh, he still wasn't satisfied. He wanted Bud in jail or hanged. And uh, so he swore out another uh, complaint against Bud, citing new evidence. And uh, uh, so the prosecuting attorney, who was new, said, oh, this looks great, like take it on. But uh, unfortunately, when he went to uh, in front of the judge, the judge threw it back out again. and all legal proceedings for the Meadows Blue Feud were finally, or at least that part of the Meadows Blue Feud were finally ended. But that wasn't the end of it all. So old Frank Tabor, he was called the weasel. The weasel, yeah. Old Frank was a weasel. So Frank Tabor, uh, now Bud, you gotta remember Bud, all the, all the rest of them had moved away. They're down Stone County. Frank Tabor decided to stick around. Does anybody know Frank uh, Tabor Hollow? Mm -hmm. There's Tabor Hollow, right? 
Well, that's that's the the Tabers. He lived up uh, at uh, there in Tabor Hollow. Uh, so he and his son-in-law Winnie Hensley uh, were crossing Bull Creek down at the bottom of Tabor Hollow, and they encountered the Blues. Uh, some of the Blues. They were the sons. Two of them were the sons of uh, Jake, and two of them were the sons of another Blue, and. They had been getting into it with Frank Tabor about, mm. about wood and about uh, lumber because that time the, the uh, trains were coming in big time, you know, and there was a, there was a big industry in timbers for, the, you know, for, you know, for train tracks, right? So they were having arguments. Frank Tabor was accusing the Blues of coming over on his property, stealing lumber, and they were accusing Frank Tabor of coming over there and stealing the lumber that they had stole. And so, you know, it was, anyway, they were arguing and uh, they got in an argument. Um, they decided to, uh, to try to work it out by just doing a fist fight. So, but when, uh, when uh, Wendy Hensley started losing, uh, they pulled out guns. Mm -hmm. And then that's, the shooting started. So, uh, Frank Tabor was shot and killed, and Winnie Hensley was wounded. Uh, there was Ben Ballou, Harlan Ballou, Linza, and Frank Ballou. Uh, they were all there. Uh, this is uh, Frank Tabor. This is his daughter, Ida, his wife, right there. And uh, this is uh, Winnie Hensley behind the newspaper. That's the four, uh, the four Tabors. So Frank Tabor is, is if you ever go to Meadows, Meadows Cemetery, there's a big, huge uh, headstone out there in the northeast corner of the cemetery that's Frank Tabor. And it's got his wife on there. However, she is not buried there. There's not a death date because she ended up married one of the Terrys. <laughs> <laughs> and they moved out to Montana and they, anyway, they, they got away from here and they lived out there and they're, they're buried out there. So the, uh, the four blues are charged. <coughs> It, there was months of delays for this one. Uh, mainly there was a lot of, remember, this is 1917, 1918, a 19, uh, time frame, the flu. Remember, uh, you got, uh, there was a lot of sickness going around at that time. So there was like months of delays because of that. On March 5th of 1918, finally, they separated the trials. Linza Blue goes on trial, and uh, he's found not guilty, uh, basically because of uh, self-defense, uh, plea of self-defense. Uh, the prosecuting attorney drops all the charges for the rest of the defendants, and uh, you would think it's over. But no, there's more. <laughs> uh, really, uh, not much more other than there was a guy named Link Richardson who ended up, he was a juror on the uh, Linza Blue trial, and uh, Link uh, was arrested later on for perjury because he uh, said he didn't know the Blues. Well, come to find out, he's really good friends with them. But, uh, but uh, Link was uh, arrested. He went to trial. He was acquitted, though, uh, by the jury. And that ended all the trials, Mike. Yeah. So, was the feud really over a fence? Well, I think the fence was just a tipping point. It was uh, basically uh, Pete Blue uh, had accused Bud Meadows of actually being the one that killed little Claudie. Uh, there was many instances where the uh, witnesses said that he, they, he was calling Bud Meadows a child killer. And so he, he, he had this in his mind and believed that, that Bud was uh, a child killer. Uh, I don't know whether his father Steve believed it or not, but he probably kind of went along with uh, his, his son Pete. And so that had been brewing for quite some time. And, and finally, the issue with the fence was just the tipping point that where it finally he had had enough and they started shooting. Uh, none of these men were saints. I will tell you right now, you know, I'm looking at my own family here, and all of them, the Blues and the Meadows, they all had a history of um, uh, everything from you know carrying concealed weapon, which you couldn't do in those days, believe it or not, uh, to uh, uh, I know Frank Blue got in trouble for uh, making you know noises in church and he was arrested for that uh, yeah yeah they were serious about that back then and uh, uh danny we would have been in trouble we yeah i think danny and i did that once or twice when we were growing up but uh 
but yeah, they were you know they were arrested for all kinds of little things. Uh, so none of them were saints here, you know. But anyway, I wanted to show you uh, real quickly. This is kind of the area. Let me come around here where this happened. This is uh, Bull Creek, obviously winding through here. Uh, this is uh, Gra Gravelly Hollow over down here. This is basically where the Meadows Schoolhouse is down here in this area. This is where Alexander Meadows was killed, uh, right in this area. The Cheney and uh, Christian County line runs right about in here. In fact, there's a rumor that Alexander Meadows' house was split by the county line. I don't know if that was true or not. That's, supposedly that's what it was. Uh, if you go on up here, uh, for example, here's Tabor Hollow right here. This is uh, Goodnight Hollow. This is the area where the shooting took place. The fence was right across here. This was the Blue Homestead here. This was the Meadows Homestead right here. And uh, if you go up there uh, today, uh, uh, the people were very, very nice. The, there's, it's actually been split up. There's a few homes here, but the one home that's on the most west side up here, those people are extremely nice. And they let me go uh, look around. They showed me the, the uh, Bud Meadows Foundation there. And there's actually a little cemetery in their front yard, and they maintain it, uh, the, the original owners of the land. This is uh, there too as well. So they, they didn't want to destroy that. They, they kept it, and they were a bit, they're really big into history too. Uh, there's another guy that owns a house here, and there's a house there. Uh, so it's been split up, but that's the area. Down here is where uh, Jake went to get the water for, uh, and the hat to bring back to Jimmy uh, when he was shot. So, um, where are they now? Some of the things, uh, by the way, if anybody knows where Pete's skull is, I'd love to find it. Uh, <laughs> nobody knows. It was never reburied. Supposedly never reburied. Uh, but nobody knows. Um, I think my grandfather wrote, or somebody wrote, they did, thought it probably ended up on a doctor's shelf somewhere. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, but it was never found. Uh, Bud's Winchester. We'd, I'd certainly like to find it. I'd like to see it. You know, I don't want it, but I'd like to see it. Uh, I did have a when I did this presentation up at Christian County, there was a guy there that he's a descendant of Bob Meadows, and he has Bob Meadows' as a shotgun. So that was kind of interesting to see. I do know that uh, I was in touch with another guy who had Pete's, uh, Pete uh, Blue's pistol, and it was in really bad shape. He had given it to somebody years ago, and he can't remember who he gave it to, but he said it was a Meadows descendant. So somebody has that old beat-up uh, uh, pistol that Pete used that day there. Uh, if anybody has photos of J Steve, Pete, and Jimmy when they were alive, I'd love to see those. Uh, the only known photos of those were they're dead in the uh, in their actual in the, in the bed. Uh, photos of Alexander Meadows. That's certainly my holy grail. Is my great 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 grandfather, and to my knowledge, I've never seen a photo of him. Uh, I'd love to know where Claudie Matthews, little Claudie, was buried. But my guess is. Uh, he was probably buried up at Chadwick and uh, probably with a field stone. Everybody was pretty poor. As you guys have known, anybody who's gone out to cemeteries around here, there's a lot of field stones, right? Yeah. And you don't know who, who was buried there, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, people were poor po back then. And, uh, and uh, you know, they, they used whatever they could. And uh, I'd love to know what happened to Gertrude and Joe Ballou. Those were Steve Ballou's youngest kids. Uh, there's no record I can't find on censuses or anything of them. I, my guess is they probably went to live with a family member, but I've never met a family member that, that knew what happened to them. So, you know, maybe they were consumed by one of the sicknesses, I don't know, that went around, but uh, I can't find anything about them. And, uh, and then there was reference in there about my great-great-grandfather, uh, Chris Meadows, uh, that during the trial that his youngest son died, and there wasn't enough people to even attend the funeral because they were all attending the trials of Bud Meadows. And I've never heard of who that child was. I'd love to know who it was, but I can't find that anything out about that as well. So if anybody knows that, that'd be great as well. So are there any questions? Holy, that was a lot of information. Oh, uh, it, it really is. It's a hard, it's hard, a lot of hard, it's hard to uh, absorb it all. And that's why I recommend you read the book. Uh, I, that, was, that was really probably one of the most difficult things is I, I wanted to make sure 
was getting the timeline of events and then who was married to who and who was related to who. And I tried to want to make that as clear. I tried to keep my genealogy background in mind when I wrote the book so that uh, even when I, uh, I, in the back, I tried to put a, a, a reference or an index of everybody that I, that I could think of that was involved, whether it was a, even if it was a, a juror in the trial, you know, so somebody could go, oh, my family member was a juror in that trial. I just wanted to try and keep that in mind and put as many, you know, as much information as I could to use it as a reference document as, as much of anything too, so, yeah. The uh, Meadows Cemetery and Schoolhouse, are they on a trail? I mean, do you no. actually go and... No, if you go, uh, if you go off of uh, uh, 70, what's that, 76 West, 76. 76 West around Mountain Road. Okay. And it's kind of tricky because uh, it comes around a curve really fast, and, it, it, and right on that curve, it kind of goes like down a little bit. It splits off, but they both end up the same place, which is down at the, bow, down at the bottom. They're uh, down at Bull Creek. They built a new bridge. That's where they built the new bridge. Um, they used to have a low water bridge there where everybody went and picnic, but now they built that new bridge there. And, but you fall across that bridge, go about a mile along that dirt road, gravel dirt road up north of there, and you'll see it easily right there on the right. It's very, very clear. The, the, the schoolhouse and the uh, cemetery are both there. There's a big monument and there's a, a flag there American flag. We put the flagpole up a few years ago, and then a big monument in front that says Meadows Cemetery there. Uh, but you'll see a lot of people there that uh, from the book, <coughs> as well as uh, the relatives. There's a lot. There's some Gideons in there. Um, you know, a lot. There's Blues Meadows. Most of the Blues, though, that were killed, uh, all the Blues are over Spokane, Spokane Cemetery. A lot of Blues over there. That's where Jimmy and and Steve and and uh, Pete are all at. Pete's name wasn't really Pete. It'll say there's just a stone in the in the ground that says JS. And that's his his nickname was Pete. So it doesn't say Pete, it just says JS. Uh, Steve's stone is there, but his wife, she was buried there with him, but there's no name or anything. She was just buried there and it was not added. So but there's a lot of the blues are over there. Just oh, yeah. there's no bad blood now between them. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, when I came back in 2000 to a Meadows schoolhouse reunion, every every other year we had it just a, a last month. Every other year uh, we have a Meadows schoolhouse reunion. A lot of Meadows and Blues are there, obviously. Uh, my first one that I attended in in 2000 something, uh, I said something about, oh, the Meadows Blue feud. And a guy looked at me right in the eye and said, we don't talk about that here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, okay. And uh, uh, I think you were talking about how my grandfather, you talked to my grandfather about reprinting his book, and he said, no, he got too much flack over it. And I just couldn't believe it. I was like, you know, it's been 100 years. And uh, so uh, I will tell you that uh, I did that, this presentation up at Christian County, and we had 135 people at the, at the presentation. And 90% of them were Meadows of Blues, 75% of them were Blues. And they were just, everybody was just so grateful about the book and finally, you know, telling the whole story. And no, I, to answer your, I, nobody. There, it, now it's just like interest. Everybody wants to know the story and it's, it's not a bad blood as far as I know for anybody anymore. We were just, everybody's just real friendly and haven't, you know, they were great. Yeah. Is that Hosey Blue uh, related to the one that had the church in Springfield? He was at my presentation in Christian County. There was actually three Hosey Blues at the uh, presentation. So he, he schooled me on the right way to say Hosey because I was saying it in the biblical sense and I was saying Hosea. And he said, Hosey, Hosey, Hosey. So, because he's Hosey. And there's, but there was three Hoseys there and they kept uh, making sure I said it right. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. All yes, right. sir. Uh, Kelly. Yeah, yeah. Hey, how you doing? Your grandfather, as I recall from the payroll stuff, his name was Christopher Columbus Meadows. Christopher right? Columbus, yes. Was, was he named after your great friend? Was he also Christopher Columbus Meadows? He was. Great -great -grandfather. Yeah, the, the one I showed up there on the screen, the yeah. Chris Meadows, he was Christopher, Christopher Columbus. Columbus Meadows as well. He was named directly after him. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Yeah. yeah. He's actually buried. Uh, 
he's an interesting character. Uh, his, he's buried with his fifth wife. Uh, his fifth wife, he outlived uh, the other four. With it, he, he married sisters, uh, and both of those are at the Meadow Cemetery, by the way. He married uh, two sisters. Uh, one died, and he married the other sister. Then he married, but he's married, he's buried with his fifth wife in California. Yeah. Um, all of this happened in just kind of north of uh, where the German ranch, what we used to call the German ranch, used to be right in that area. Where that development's at? Yeah, that, but it's not a development center. Yeah. They used to call it German ranch. Yeah, it's, exactly. The cemetery is just a little bit north of that. But yes. I, I was thinking, did the Meadows own part of the German ranch? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah, they own it. Uh, Alexander did, but after Alexander was killed, Allie couldn't keep up with all that, and so she started having to sell it. You know, she could. All the kids were split up. She gave some of the land to some of the family members and sold a lot of it. But he had land that, that was basically uh, probably about two miles wide and a swath of Bull Creek that went four or five miles up into Christian County and then back down. It was a lot of land that that he was uh, that he had at the time. But it all straddled the county line. It, it was across, yeah, back and forth across the county line, exactly. And again, I don't know, I've never seen the foundation. It's gone for Alexander's uh, house, but supposedly it split, the line split it. I don't know if it's true or not. I remember Chris telling me an awful lot about it before he wrote the book. So yeah. And it was just names and stuff I'd never heard of in, in one ear and out the other. Yeah, that's a good question. I, in writing the book, I will tell you that I was very careful. I did not want to use any family stories. So I, it, it was something that somebody said or you heard. It was a good starting point to go, okay, I'm going to use that to go see if it's true or not. But unless I could prove it, I didn't put it in the book. I tried to go, I didn't want to write it from the Meadows side. I didn't write, want to write it from anybody's side. I want to be very neutral about it and only use what I could find that was documented. So. I, hopefully I documented it well. I think you'll see in the, in the book. Yes, sir. So are there, uh, I think you, you touched on it briefly. Uh, are there still quite a few meadows in blue? In the, I know Kenny Blue lives up there. Uh, <laughs> on, on the, uh, yeah. on the uh, east side of Saddlebrook, are there still quite a few meadows in blues, still property owners and still living there? Yeah, especially blues. Uh, not so much. Uh, there's a couple of meadows I saw that are in that area, but Blues, there's blues all over up and down Bull Creek. Uh -huh. uh, again, a lot of them were at my presentation there. And uh, and then a lot of them were at the Meadows reunion the other day, or the Meadows Schoolhouse reunion the other day. And they were like, oh yeah, I just live there, I just live there, I just live there. So they're, they're right around there. So you cringe when I said Kenny Blue, what was that about? No, no, it wasn't about it, was okay, just okay, okay. not about no, Kenny. No, no. It was just when you said, oh, there are many Meadows of Blues still around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's still a bunch of them, that's for sure, yeah. Uh, but especially the blues. The blue, John Wick was pretty prolific. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Randy, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>